Thank you, Rick, um, for your kind introduction. So let's start our work. Um, imminent apocalypse. Why it is important um, for me to raise this topic at this moment? Um, there are a few reasons that I think um, really strikes me. Um, one thing is that we all know we live in a cornucopia of crisis. Um, last week, we had a fantastic lecture about food crisis, and you know that pandemic is still going on, and uh, we know there's a war going on not far from us, and we know the climate change already bring very significant um, catastrophe to many parts of our world. But somehow we feel um, it's a kind of knowledge. And if you ask yourself what I'm going to do and what does this all apocalypse, if I call it, mean to me? And how apocalypse is different from catastrophe or crisis or disaster? And uh, how all that, of, all that knowledge is relevant to me? What my personal um, response could be? What can I do? And this actually brings us to some important questions that we ask about. So the crisis of paralysis, that we find all this knowledge doesn't really bring meaning to me as an individual and it remains an abstract apocalypse. It remains a kind of concept. So that's the reason I raised this question, imminent apocalypse, what imminent actually mean. So first of all, we tackle the question, what is apocalypse? We have been dealing this question for long, at least for the past year, but if you think through it, how it is different from catastrophe, disaster, and a crisis. And I find that there is a particularly unique structure of apocalypse, which has these three components, recognition, rupture, and the return. If you look at the biblical text where apocalypse, this term, come from, you get revelation, eschatology, and soteriology. Revelation means that the God tells you about the beginning and end. Eschatology means there's a prophecy, um, there's, there will be an end of the world. And the soteriology is that there might be some kind of salvation, but it's not guaranteed. But if you look into our life itself, we, we might recognize these three stages, recognition, recognition of the crisis and the rupture is a completely absolute phase change and that there might be a possibility of returning. So why imminent apocalypse? Why is it important at this moment we talk about imminence? So in this sense, I want to contrast with inherent. Why I don't call it inherent apocalypse? Yes, it is true. Apocalypse has an inherent end. It seems like the end is already doomed at the very beginning. So when we talk about inherent, we might think about coherent because it's come from the same etymology, the Latin etymology, high era, which means stick to something inherent, something really predetermined. If you talk about inherent apocalypse, you are talking about what apocalypse is, what we think about apocalypse. However, what I want to emphasize tonight is imminent apocalypse, is the imminence of apocalypse. It is not about what we think about apocalypse or what apocalypse is, but how we think about apocalypse. And something remains within myself, in my very meaning of being, and that's also rooted in the Latin um, etymology of imminent, which um, based on the idea of manner, which means to remain, something that wells within the self. So there is a beautiful phrase by Heidegger that says, sich an ihm selbst zeigenders. And that is the phenomenality. The phenomenality of apocalypse is the imminent apocalypse, the imminence of apocalypse. So put together, imminent apocalypse means that we are talking about the phenomenality, we are talking about what apocalypse means to me 
to an individual and how I feel about it. And in terms of the recognition of the crisis, in terms of how I feel the end of the world, the absence of existence, and will there be a return? And in this way, we contrast with inherent apocalypse, which means the necessity, the inherent end in the very beginning. Okay, so this sounds a little bit abstract, so I would like to show you a four minute short film which might tell you something about this imminence of apocalypse. Yes, Davis, that's right. He's my father. I was told I need to um, uh, book a follow-up appointment with Dr. Jenkins. The 17th, yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you, bye. Are you all right? Yeah. How far along are you? What? Well, I, I was just wondering how long... Uh... Sorry. Twenty-one weeks on Tuesday. I'll be twenty-one weeks on Tuesday. Not long to go. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. You're finding it tough. You must be excited. I'm scared. Of what? Everything. All of it. I'm sure you'll be fine. People say that, but what if I'm not? What then? Well, I'm sure your husband will... He'll manage. Everybody does. Do they? What about your family? It's complicated. You don't get on? It's just me and my dad. And he's sick. So... It'll be okay. Come on, this is us. Dad, come on. So um, now we go to our central topic of today, reading art as philosophy. Um, so here I also like to um, introduce a little bit of uh, the definition of what is philosophy, what is art, and what art do I mean by reading here. 
Um, so philosophy, um, if you think about the original meaning, it's love of wisdom. And in a more concrete sense, in our modern time, probably is how do we think? And through thinking, be in the world. And uh, what is art? I think everybody has different mean concept of what art is. For me, there is a striking um, little slogan which I found on the wall uh, in Munich Art School m many years ago. It says, the essence, the art is that to pursue the nature of things into infinity. And then what is reading? Everybody reads. But have you asked yourself what, it does, what does reading actually mean? Probably reading means you perceive the thing into language. Um, here there is a methodology. It's that it doesn't mean that I have a perfect theory of what apocalypse is or what imminent apocalypse is. Then I read artworks and to illustrate my points. If I do it this way, then I get nothing new from the artworks because I already have these conceptual frameworks. So what I would like to do is also invite you to do um, with me to, tonight is that to engage with artworks and to listen to the authentic voice of the work themselves and see whether we can discover something meaningful, unexpec unexpected, and uh, something for yourself. So we will engage these three pieces of work on reading art as philosophy. So I have one piece from literature, uh, the beginning of a novel by Virginia Woolf. And I have a piece of visual art I would like to share with you, um, a painting by Jacobus Varel. And uh, I have a piece of music also share with you. And I hope you will also enjoy it. Um, first, um, is the beginning passage of The Waves, a novel by Virginia Woolf. Thank you. The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay on the horizon dividing the sea from the sky, and the grey cloth became barred with thick strokes moving, one after another beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other perpetually. As they neared the shore, each bar rose, heaped itself, broke and swept a thin veil of white water across the sand. The wave paused and then drew out again, sighing like a sleeper whose breath comes and goes unconsciously. Gradually, the dark bar on the horizon became clear, as if the sediment in an old wine bottle had sunk and left the glass green. Behind it, too, the sky cleared, as if the white sediment there had sunk, or as if the arm of a woman couched beneath the horizon had raised a lamp, and flat bars of white, green and yellow spread across the sky like the blades of a fan. Then she raised her lamp higher, and the air seemed to become fibrous, and to tear away from the green surface, flickering and flaming in red and yellow fibres, like the smoky fire that roars from a bonfire. Gradually, the fibres of the burning bonfire were fused into one haze, one incandescence, which lifted the weight of the woollen grey sky on top of it and turned it to a million atoms of soft blue. The surface of the sea slowly became transparent and lay rippling and sparkling until the dark stripes were almost rubbed out. Slowly, the arm that held the lamp raised it higher and then higher until a broad flame became visible. An arc of fire burnt on the rim of the horizon and all round it the sea blazed gold. So you might find this uh, quite a compl complicated, complicated passage. So um, I highlight the metaphors similars and uh, some important images there and I hope now you can read it again and then perhaps you can think about what it means to you. The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky except 
that the sea was slightly creased as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay on the horizon, dividing the sea from the sky, and the grey cloth became barred with thick strokes moving one after another beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other perpetually. As they neared the shore, each bar rose, heaped itself, broke and swept a thin veil of white water across the sand. The wave paused and then drew out again, sighing like a sleeper whose breath comes and goes unconsciously. Gradually, the dark bar on the horizon became clear, as if the sediment in an old wine bottle had sunk and left the glass green. Behind it, too, the sky cleared, as if the white sediment there had sunk, or as if the arm of a woman couched beneath the horizon, had raised a lamp and flat bars of white, green and yellow spread across the sky like the blades of a fan. Then she raised her lamp higher, and the air seemed to become fibrous, and to tear away from the green surface flickering and flaming in red and yellow fibres, like the smoky fire that roars from a bonfire. Gradually, the fibres of the burning bonfire were fused into one haze, one incandescence, which lifted the weight of the woollen grey sky on top of it and turned it to a million atoms of soft blue. The surface of the sea slowly became transparent and lay rippling and sparkling until the dark stripes were almost rubbed out. Slowly, the arm that held the lamp raised it higher, and then higher, until a broad flame became visible, an arc of fire burnt on the rim of the horizon, and all around it the sea blazed gold. Great. So, um, how do we understand this passage? I think you might have some association with your own life experience to understand all these metaphors, which seems to be um, not immediately penetrable. But if you look at the scholarship, they will tell you um, who was Virginia Woolf and uh, what she was thinking about might she, um, when she was writing this. Um, but I think most important is that we engage in this text itself, because every secret is already in those words. So that's why um, we create this narrative system does not add anything more. All the words are already in the text and the images are already there, but we need to think about it and to read carefully and to ask what does it mean to me. So um, roughly you can see there are four categories, four kinds of experience she seems to talk about. Um, first is pure experience, observations, like you see at the very beginning, the sun had not yet risen, and the sea was indistinguishable from the sky, and then how the, the sea, um, the waves are moving. But then slowly you find she uses a kind of, um, all kinds of metaphors to describe what she s sees. So she said, um, it was like a thin veil of white water. It was as if the arm of a woman, and etc. But then, if you read more, you find that she used some kind of image which may not make sense to you. This I called conceptual metaphor or simile. So she talks about there might be a woman who raised her lamp higher. First, there was a woman couch beneath the horizon. This is quite weird already. But then there was a thing that he, she said, um, there is a wine bottle. As if when she looks at the waves at the sea, as if the sediment in an old wine bottle had sunk and left the glass green. So it perfect makes sense when you first read it. But then if you look at the wine bottle, 
the green glass one bottle when the sediments sink. Do you see the green glass? Yes, this is green, but when the language conveys meaning to say, because the sediments sink, and then it lets you see the green grass. But here there's no green grass. So what does it actually mean? Uh, it started to make no sense. And, it, and more, when she talks about this image, and she said, if you remember, then the air seemed to become fibrous. And this is pretty striking, because at this level, I'm thinking that she is not talking about any metaphor. She does not so the air is like a fiber. What does that mean? Um, but he, she said, the air seemed to become fibrous. And here, he do, she does not say, I refer to the air, and then with a metaphor, I compare with something else. That's incomparable, fiber and air. You cannot connect these two. So I call it non-referential semantics. It's not corresponding with each other, and it brings some dissonance into your mind. And uh, here, I think she brings herself in, and she is sharing, by using language, a kind of private experience. But she uses the language that we all use. And then it starts to make no sense. Because if you think more, the air seems to become fibrous. And if you play with the word, and you might say the air seems to become sticky or tangled, sheer, shredded, knitted, threaded, or sharp. But if you replace all these words with this fibrous, it seems like not quite right, because that may not what she actually means. So what does she mean? The air becomes fibrous. Here, I think she, pro she really um, invited us into a private domain, a kind of feeling that is very primordial. And uh, it's not really attached to language already. Here at the stage, you seem to create language. And uh, why it's apocalyptic? Because I think at, at the moment, if you remember, she was describing the sunrise. Because eventually, she returns to the very um, pure ex ex experience observation, the sun finally rose. But before that, she makes this rupture. The rupture tells us that when we feel it, when we engage ourselves, our mind into it, and what rupture actually means. It is a very, very private emotion and a feeling. It's hard to put into language how we have to do it. So there is this dissonance in it. And uh, maybe that is the feeling of apocalypse that is imminent within us. And here, imminence means it's everywhere, but it is hard to be aware. So um, we can learn from this work is that the premise we will explore is a necessary element of an apocalypse. It is an imminent, phenomenal experience of this recognition, rupture, and return. So the sunrise, the, the day from night to day, the day started to begin. And we never realized this is actually an apocalyptic moment. And we all have it. Because we all have it, we don't realize it. And the wolf through her writing and shows what kind of experience it is. Without such experience, we're just going through the motion. The apocalypse is just a catastrophe or disaster or annoyance or another first world problem. There is only a structure, theory, but no meaning. So lessons from this work is that an apocalypse is a transition. It is a phase transition, for example, from night to day. And the world's dis distinct description makes an inner experience of such a transition ex 
explicit simply by showing how something doesn't make sense. And that goes through a personal and a private place. Without such a face, there is no change in the self. And when the self does not change, the world did not change. When the world does not change, there is no apocalypse. The phenomenon arises in the self, or it is not phenomenon. So there is actually a paradox that apocalypse is imminent, and we are within apocalypse. And we change along with the world, and we feel the change from within. But it is, this is exactly where the problem comes from. Because if we are inside the change, this changes everything, and we may not feel it. We, we, we do not feel it because it is imminent. And then um, I would like to engage this uh, piece of artwork, which is quite um, unique and uh, unusual. Because first of all, have you ever heard of this artist, Jacobus Varel? Tell you the truth, I, I knew him, I encountered him in this year and uh, in February the first time. And uh, the second time was just a week ago when I went to Munich at Pinakothek. And there was, there is uh, still going on until June 19th, um, a very special exhibition of one piece of work and, uh, by Jacobus Varel. And uh, he, um, he, is Dutch, he was a Dutch painter in uh, 17th century, pretty much um, very uh, contemporary of uh, um, Johannes Vermeer. And when you go to Pinakothek now, for example, you will see this painting, and you will see here is the label. And uh, he might be active during the um, 17th century, and uh, this is the name of that painting, and uh, this is just, um, the museum just uh, got it uh, through this foundation, Siemens Foundation. And uh, if you think about this, look at this painting again, um, Ask yourself, what do you see? I think many people might think that's nothing really unusual. It's about everyday life. And uh, if you think of Amir, and she, uh, sorry, he was famous about um, painting this every, everyday scene. So that may be another Amir. And uh, what can we see? So you might just go away. But I would like rather invite you to look a little bit deeper and stand there um, a little bit longer. So what do you see? Um, you might see first there's the buildings. And these buildings we might encounter also in Artestadt here in Heidelberg, not much different, although it should be in Holland, in Netherlands. And you might see a few people on the street. And you might think that's all oh, historical representation of daily life at that time. If you look carefully, go closer, you might see a bakery there. But is there anything unusual? Only after you stand in front of, like me, more than half an hour, for example, then you started to question it because everything start to collapse, start to um, has little kind of uh, um, incoherence coming. First of all, light and shadow. Um, if you look closely at those buildings and uh, you feel it's difficult to identify where the light source come from. Uh, if it's from top, then the bottom should be dark, but the bottom part all these people there seems to be enlightened. And then if you look closely towards those buildings, and then if you want to identify, for example, the middle, and then the light source should be from front. But then if you look at the parallel building there, and then it's in dark. Why they are same position, but one is lightened and the other is darkened? in shadow. And also, the parallel buildings, and the, again, 
one in light, one in shadow, but they are completely at the same position. And it seems like the, all these buildings have different kinds of light source, and that doesn't make much sense. And then if you look even closer, and if you see how the, paint, the buildings are painted, and you realize there are black lines there, and there are white stripes there. So that seemed the contour of the buildings, and these are seem to be the windows. But why these are the white, black, and these are white? And uh, this white patches, what does that actually mean? Why they are like that? It also doesn't make much sense. And then you stand longer, and then you look more into it, it then you find it strange. That uh, if you look, if you concentrate on this building, and you find that the perspective on the top is goes to here, and then the horizontal line should be here, whereas the bottom part, and then if the perspective points here, then all of a sudden the horizontal becomes, hor oh, sorry, the horizon line. The horizon line should be here. So the same building, you have two different horizon lines. Wow, how is this possible? Um, if you look at all the other, other parts of the building, that same question will happen to you. The perspective doesn't go very coherent, and the, the horizon line also different for the same building. And uh, the reason probably is that he painted a very, very tall building here. If you make it like the same perspective, and then it will seem to be very steep and doesn't look like so familiar. And um, interestingly, if you think of all these things make this building actually falling apart rather than unite together, and how this painting is unified. Then you will think, okay, color. How does color make sense here? So we look into colors. Then we find, interestingly, the woman's clothing share the color of the white panels, and then the black shares with the um, shadows. And then interestingly, the sleeves of the woman share with the bricks. But there is no logical connection between the woman and the bricks and uh, the, the clothing and the uh, window panels. So there is also no logic in it to why they are in the same color, how they are unified. So here, we find that Varel actually paints out of causality. He doesn't follow any logic that we consider is important. And he questioned the causalities. He paints such a familiar scene, but if you think and you look more and ask questions, how they are actually connected, and it doesn't make sense. It seems to actually it falling apart. And especially if you lower down yourself, imagine you are part of them, like those people, sorry. And imagine this artistad here, and imagine here is a bakery. Have you ever stand in front of a bakery and talking like that? Have you ever seen anyone who chat with each other like that? Truth to be told, I've been here almost a year, I never see people doing this. And uh, it's complete, completely real, sounds real. It completely look familiar, but if you, you, quest, you think about it with them, not think for them, but think with them, and you look into how those elements are composed, it's certainly all falling apart and it doesn't make sense. And especially if you look deeply into this figure, and it is actually a man with very big head and without shadows. If you think someone without shadow, that he is floating on the floor rather than he is walking. So, um, yeah, and if you look at the windows, and why some window has panels, some window doesn't have, and why some window has transparent panels. So all kinds of questions arise, arise if you look deeply and standing longer than 
half an hour. So this is what I mean, the deep viewing, looking into the world themselves and uh, try to listen to the voice of it and dialogue with it. It's a, a true encounter. So uh, with this encounter, with this dialogue, we find the words falling apart at the joints at the Varel's painting. And it shows that he was actually paint not what we think about, but how we think about. We inhabit in this concept, inhabit in causalities, but we don't realize all these things look familiar to us, look real to us, actually doesn't make sense, actually falling apart at the joints. And we are within apocalypse, but we don't really feel it. Probably because we are within it, we are within it, but we are not in the catastrophe. That's why we don't feel it. So the apocalypse um, imagery which we normally encounter is like John Martin's. And you have this storm, and you have this sufferings, and you have the image of the end of the world, and it's very obvious. But this looks like a God's view. But we are humans. We live within apocalypse. We actually change with it, but we don't feel it. It sounds all so familiar. And the Varel shows how it is and how it works. So lessons from the, from the work. We are in the world, and an imminent apocalypse will be unnoticeable at first. As we notice the rapture, the feeling of pre presence and meaning arises only when you deeply listen to it. Ruptures can be a source of relational tensions that underlie our feeling of being in the world. We may consider this a type of polyphony, but there are a lot of sound. But what we mean by polyphony here? So I now invite you to listen to a piece of music by Franz Schubert. Yeah, sorry. Could you help me? It's great. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, this doesn't work. Yeah. Thank you.
So um, I actually would like to invite you to write a few words or sentence, whatever you heard, and uh, what elicit in you, and uh, you can write ganz einfach und klar, nothing to talk about. That's all fine. Um, maybe we can spread cards. That's already there. If you already have the cards, just think a little bit, um, a few seconds, and uh, write down a few words, a sentence, anything. Um, we will not collect it, and uh, you don't have to read out. But uh, since we are talking about imminent apocalypse, and uh, it might be useful for yourself to just record a few words, this momentary feeling, that's authentic experience, what it means to you. Anything. <clears throat> there is no um, criterion or right answer. But authentic feeling counts. You can certainly bring to the discussion um, section and uh, share your thoughts. Um, so, write down now. Okay, so um, um, for this music, I hesitated a lot um, which one I should choose. Um, but this is particularly touching me because I do feel there is a recognition, rupture, and a return. And uh, um, if you look at the beginning part, see that this is the beginning and there is a repetition with recognition. It's a ardantino, so it's a walking pace. And then you will feel there is a rupture and it's accelerated in the middle part and finally there is a certain a kind of returning. And if you look a little bit um, deeper into the, into the music, and you feel there is a little soft transition. So the rupture is not all of a sudden happens. It, it slowly starts and then there is acceleration. And then you will see, uh, you will hear this uh, chromatic tension. So actually the notes are all at the very beginning, but then the speed completely different. 
So it comes from within. All the elements are already there. It's within the self, but the experience, the feeling, the emotions are all different. It's so dramatic because of the speed. And then you will see there is a culmination, the peak here, and then slowly it's deacceleration, de and then there is a gentle release. And then finally, there is a returning. But the returning is not a complete rep repetition of, of the beginning. Because if there is a polyphonic music, that means when you hear the, the major voice, there is also a company, a kind of voice at the below. It's accompanied. So there are several voices together. And then it's slowly going on, it slowly return, it's slowly to rediscover the self. So as if the self starts and then experience this absolute transition and the rupture and the slowly finding the self, but the self has been changed. It's never the same. But somehow you need to recognize the self, still maintain it, and then maybe go to some closure or find some end, but that's okay. So um, Schubert's music gave us a sense this what imminent apocalypse could mean, what kind of returning that we might be able to look for. Um, but there's no solution. Everybody needs their own answer. And everybody needs to look for the way by yourself. So lesson from this work is that meaning is not structure. You have this recognition, rupture, and returning, but the structure doesn't tell you anything about what means what apocalypse means to you. Meaning arises from relationships. So the music actually tells you how the internal relationships is important to shape the emotion, to shape the world that you are living in. All the elements are all there, but when the relationship changes and the feeling changes and the, your reaction changes, the experience of relation comes from their polyphony. And such meaning from relationality is emergent. It's not inherent. It's not doomed. It's not just the fate. It's how you make it. And it cannot be reduced to its constitutes. So if you have a little bit time to reflect upon the three pieces that we have just experienced, Wolf's um, novel, Barrel's painting, Schubert's music, they provide certain kind of complementary and the reinforcing the views on the construction or creation of meaning. So from Virginia Woolf's piece, we can find what, what we can mean that apocalypse is imminent, why the personal experience is crucial, and why this field of the private experience, and then Refund the language to express why this procedure is significant or important, crucial for apocalypse. Because only that, the self, the self really um, experienced the change. However, because we are within the apocalypse and we are outside the catastrophe, so Varel's painting shows us how even if the rupture happens at the joints, we may not aware of, we not be, may not be aware of it. Because we are changed within the, within the world and with the world, and that the change is not obvious to us. We are ignorant of it. And uh, then Franz Schubert's piece actually shows how returning might be possible. How it, the returning comes from internal relationality, and how do we feel it? How the texture of our emotional choice that shapes the way and the shapes the world that we are li living in. So um, here I also introduced a methodology that I do research with apocalypse. It's not that uh, I have a complete theory or philosophical um, hypothesis what apocalypse is, then I use artworks to demonstrate it. On the contrary, I want to live with those works and I want to hear the, vo the works, the voice of the works themselves 
and ask about what does the artwork have to say about it and listen to it, really listen to it and uh, see it, deep viewing it and read it and then question it and co-experience with it. And then to test the language and to see how language could convey a sense of um, meaning, but in some way it is deceptive. So um, I hope that uh, this structure is a bit clear for you. That is epistemy, phronesis, and the back again. We come from a certain sketch of epistemy, which means a little bit of theory about recognition, rupture, and returning this arc, or the internal structure about apocalypse. And we have this phronesis the vignettes, the artworks that allow us to experience the real actual apocalypse within ourselves. And we create a certain narrative system to help us to listen to the voice of the works themselves. And uh, finally, we go back to ourselves and interrogate the premise of the language of the narrative system and the epistemy we had at the very beginning and refine it. So, What's the take home message? When we are dealing with deeper question of meaning, and our most powerful tool is introspection. And that is why philosophy is not psychology. Psychology is about the other people's mind. Philosophy is to see by yourself. And the introspection is the wonderful tool that all of us have. So dare to see for yourself. Thank you. And uh, I really, I'm really grateful for those friends and teachers who uh, engage with me about these works. And uh, also many thanks to um, Kappas that allow me to have this opportunity at the very first place. Thank you.